Wales, a country of castles brimming with legends like King Arthur, ancient churches, mountain passes, uncrowded beaches, and hills with mysteries waiting to be explored. Come with us as we discover the heart of this unspoiled country on Great Drives Wales. We'd picked a few great days in July for our journey through Wales. The weather promised to be warm and the sky sparkling clear. After a week in Scotland, we were getting used to driving on the opposite side of the road. Actually, my wife was getting used to the driving. My excuse? I was busy shooting. This is our third country today. We were heading from Scotland into North Wales via Manchester, England, along the M4 and A55 motorways. Our first stop, the city of Langolin, nestled within the beautiful Dee Valley in the northeast of Wales. It's a picturesque spot by the River Dee, surrounded by mountains to the south and the north. The town has been a traveler's favorite for centuries. Its landmark stone bridge, begun in the 1400s, connects the two sides of Langolin. It adds to the area's old world charm. We weren't the only ones who had trouble pronouncing the Welsh language. Can you try to pronounce it? No way. Oh, no. Yeah. Hallmark, we understood. Travelers used to come here by train, including Queen Victoria. Today, the historic train is used to take tourists on a seven-mile scenic run several times a day. Visitors should consider taking a short stroll up a narrow lane to visit the home of two women whose long-term love affair put Langolin on the map in the late 18th century. The stately house was the home of Miss Sarah Ponsonby and Lady Eleanor Butler. An orphan, Sarah was sent away to boarding school and became a pupil of Lady Eleanor when she was only 13. When 18, she was taken in by a couple where she had to endure the husband's unwelcome advances. Eleanor was in her early 30s at the time and about to be sent to a convent by a mother who couldn't understand why she wouldn't marry. These two Irish aristocrats understood each other's plight. Their attraction grew, and they twice tried to escape together. Finally, in 1778, with the help of Sarah's maid, Mary, they were able to begin a life together in Langolin. Mary stayed with them for the rest of her life in a cottage behind the main house. They were visited by many notables of the day, such as the Duke of Wellington, William Wordsworth, and Sir Walter Scott. Their house is still a popular destination. A good place to start any trip to Wales is at one of the tourist information centers found in most cities. This is the place for maps, books, sound advice, and even help with hotel bookings. We chose the Wild Pheasant Hotel. Set in what was once pasture land, full of wild pheasants, this 19th century structure has been brought into the 21st century without losing its charm. Its modern airy lobby is a surprising but welcome contrast to the country house exterior. 15 of the rooms have received the same modernizing treatment. All have king-size beds, sitting areas, and private bathrooms. The aptly named Spa of Tranquility is waiting to bubble your stress away. 
or you can just enjoy some quiet time by the pub or in the gardens. The best place for sunsets is the Castel Dennis Braun. Perched on a hill 750 feet above Langolin, it's only for those who can take a steep climb. The walk inspired a poet who pined for a young lady who lived in the castle. He said, though hard the steep to gain, thy smiles are harder to obtain. Its inaccessibility and commanding views made it a logical choice as a fortress since prehistoric times. A local ruler adapted it in about 1260 and built the castle. It only lasted for 17 years when it was destroyed to keep it out of the hands of invaders. Local lore has it that this is where King Arthur hid the Holy Grail, the most treasured Christian relic in the Arthurian legend. The next day, we were on our way through the rolling countryside of North Wales. This pastoral area in the Vale of Cloyd is a mixture of heather-covered moors, forests, valleys, and hills. Small country towns and rivers dot the landscape as you head north. Our destination, the medieval walled town of Conway, a world heritage site. Conway fronts a harbor that still produces the mussels that once attracted the Romans. Its rolling mountains add a delightful green belt. This was an ideal spot for Edward I to build a fortress. The French pattern was to take a green field, lay a castle on it, build a little town round it. The town would grow the vegetables, raise the sheep and the cows, and in return from the town servicing the castle, the castle protects the town. And it protects the town with a wall that goes all the way around. This wall is three quarters of a mile long, and there are 21 of these defensive towers in the wall. So the castle protects the town, the town services the castle. The sheltered town grew and prospered. Plas Mauer, or Great Hall, one of its finest homes, has been restored. Built between 1576 and 1585 for a well-to-do merchant, Robert Wynne, it's a potent symbol of the prosperous Elizabethan age. The colorful and highly detailed ornamental plaster work highlights Wynne's wealth and status. He liked to entertain and needed a large kitchen to prepare sumptuous feasts for his guests. He liked to surprise them with little touches. What we do with the fish pies, we keep the heads of the fish and stick them from the top of the pie, gazing up at you as you're eating them. Oh, how And blackbird pie, of course. And then Same feet, thing? Well, their feet would stick out, of course, of course, made of blackbirds, yes. While you probably won't find anything that exotic today, Conway's lively streets offer plenty of dining and shopping choices. The massive 13th century castle presides over the town. It's been used for celebrations since it was built. Neville Hortop, a former headmaster, history teacher, and now a guide, volunteered to give us a tour of the castle. The English monarch Edward I built Conway as part of his string of fortresses erected to control the Welsh. The walls were built of stone, with sturdy oak timbers holding up the floors. The wood was covered in lead to deter rotting. It remained a stronghold until the invention of gunpowder in the 1600s made castles obsolete. They took the roof off to sell it for the lead and that left the, the weather into the wood and the castle became really a ruin from 1660. But because there's so much stone in North Wales, nobody's stolen the, the, the stone. When the king was here, this was the hub of social activity. Go to Buckingham Palace today, you won't get within a mile of the Queen. No. But in those days, 
everyone was together. The soldiers, the, the, the king, the, the guests he's brought. So they would start eating in here at say five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And at eight o'clock the music would start and the beer would flow. And, and by midnight they're full of roast meats and beer and they are very relaxed and very happy. And they would do it again tomorrow because wherever the king was, was a banquet. In order to pay for this, the king traveled with a considerable treasury. He kept it hidden in his bedchamber. He's coming from London for some weeks. He's got to bring a lot of money. His royal treasure is here, and the money's down there, but it is a trap door in the floor. Uh -huh. But of course, there's some soldiers now billeted here to keep a close eye on this wealth down here. Shakespeare immortalized the portrayal of Richard II that occurred in the castle's chapel. Richard II sitting there, and, and Duke Percy from Northumberland is kneeling at the altar. He's got a hand on the elements of the altar. He's got a hand in the air, and he's swearing to Richard that he's telling the truth, and that Henry Bolingbroke wants to make peace. Richard went to meet Bolingbroke, who captured him and took him to the Tower of London, where he was imprisoned, starved, and beaten. Richard resigned his throne. And they made Henry Bolingbroke Henry IV. Oh. And then they told Henry, look, you've left Richard in the, castle, in the tower. He'll become a martyr. Get rid of him. And they took him up to Yorkshire and in, in Pontefract Castle, they cut his throat. <gasps> but the point I'm making is, it happened here. This is where he was betrayed. There is history around every corner at Conway. They were the pinnacle of castle building. And that's what you learn if you come to look at these at Conway. You see the top, the, the, the very pinnacle of, of, the, of the power of the castle. It really is magnificent. We were headed west to the pinnacle of Wales, Snowdonia. This mountainous region is a popular holiday center. The arrival of the railway in 1868 transformed Betisi Coed into the most popular tourist village in Snowdonia. Its numerous gift shops and specialty stores cater to nearly every taste. Its name means chapel in the wood. It's an ideal spot for those who worship the outdoors, whether for a picnic or a romp in the park. Or even a splash in the water. It stands at the junction of three rivers and valleys. It's all about relaxation surrounded by magnificent scenery. There is no shortage of scenic vistas in Snowdonia. Lakes and valleys welcome drivers, hikers, climbers, and bike riders. The Penna Pass is the head end for several hiking trails to the summit of Mount Snowdon. This craggy countryside figures in many of the Arthurian legends, from battles with giants to the hidden treasure of Merlin. The area's rock faces served as the training ground for Sir Edmund Hillary when he prepared to battle the giant Mount Everest. It still challenges climbers today. We descended from the rocky heights on our way to Bedgeleard, a picturesque village tucked into the edge of the forest just south of Mount Snowdon. Two rivers meet at the bridge in the center of the village a perfect spot to wrap up a day of adventure. We stayed overnight at the Grac Innes country house in nearby Harlech. This magnificent old farmhouse is set on an acre of lawn gardens. The owner of the inn offered to give us an insider's tour of Harlech. I've always lived in the area. We've been living in Grac Innes now for 30 years. Uh, running the business, running the guest house for the last 20. The town has a connection to the sea. This was a real sea-going community going back in the last 100 to 200 years. Uh, and then later on in 1865, the railway came along and that then made the way with the, uh, the boating industry. Access to the sea was one reason Edward I built a castle here in the late 13th century. 
Like Conwy, it was part of his iron ring of fortresses. It was always the last castle to fall, um, but probably the main reason it was the last to fall is it was the furthest away as well from England. And it's still mainly intact. It hasn't been sacked. You know, lots of castles have been absolutely flattened and sacked. Harla Castle wasn't really. The sea and harbor views in Harlech are spectacular. They call the corner, oh my God corner. <laughs> just for the reason when people just drive up the lane and they just come to the corner and right in front you've got the whole beach, the whole expanse of Harlech Bay. There are over 80 miles of beach and it's never crowded, at least to my eyes. Of course, I'm used to the beaches in Southern California. There was plenty of room for everyone for swimming, kayaking, or just for wading in the water. We drove up into the hills to see some of the lesser known parts of Harlech. I think uh, if you go to one of these countries, Wales, particularly, the more you get off the beaten track, the more you see some of these small country lanes. And this is where you get the best views, the most spectacular scenery. The sea air and the sea views and the mountain air. And we were driving across the oldest inhabited part of the area. What we are on now is actually is a Bronze Age path. This, there's a path here 4,000 years ago, but obviously in those times, 4,000 years ago, it was much warmer than it is now. You know, people would live high up on the mountains then. It was a place of timeless beauty and tranquility. This is where you see the real Wales. Places off the beaten track. You can enjoy the countryside and the views. It's all free. <laughs> we continued our journey off the beaten path as we headed south. We wanted to find out more about the legend of King Arthur and see how this tale became so deeply ingrained in Welsh folklore. We went to a small church in Pennell to meet an Arthur historian. He was the last Welsh hero. We'd lost all our integrity, our pride, and then at the beginning of the sixth century, this savior figure emerged, and for about 50 years, we were able to keep all the invaders, the Picts, the Romans. Uh, the Romans had left the Anglo-Saxons at bay. So that's why he has become not just historical, but a mythical figure. Arthur's legend was given a boost by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who wrote the history of the kings of Britain in 1138. The best way to compare it is with the whole Da Vinci code. It's as simple as that, okay? Geoffrey of Monmouth, if you like, Dan Brown. He took a legend that had historical roots. He took these stories and then embellished them, added a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and produced one of the most popular stories that you've had in Europe probably ever. Uh, because within his own generation, those stories were being printed and printed and distributed among, yes, the rich and the wealthy. Uh, exactly the same as Dan Brown. Myth or reality, Arthur is still a powerful figure in the Welsh psyche. Every defeated people wants a hero. So he was our hero. We made a lot of those 45 odd years. When there, were, when there was peace and when the Saxons were kept back, it's natural you go back to those moments. Uh, but after that, he's been used by the English crown, he's been used by everybody. Um, recently, of course, he was by Hollywood, you know, so he's one of those figures that has been used and abused down the centuries. But uh, he's still our, you know, he's still our long-awaited one. This area is steeped in Arthurian lore. It's said he fought his last battles in the hills nearby he might still feel at home among the sparsely populated areas along the Cardigan coast. It's the most rural part of Wales. Its 95,000 residents are dispersed across 1,700 square miles. The coastline is dotted with small, colorful villages, ports, and harbor towns. We wanted to stay somewhere on the coast. The Cliff Hotel sits on 30 acres overlooking the Cardigan Bay. It's a good place for launching and exploration of the beaches and secluded coves. Or for just taking in the scenery. Our off the beaten path quest revved up the next day as we drove south into the Preseli Hills of Pembrokeshire. 
Once again, we tried to stay on narrow track roads that took us deep into the countryside. The gentle heather-covered hills were beautiful and full of history. The church in Nevern was founded after the Roman period, between 500 and 600 AD. But there are several stones here that predate the church. The faint lettering makes it difficult to determine their exact significance. A 13-foot Celtic cross from around 1000 AD is decorated with an interlaced ribbon pattern symbolizing eternity. Several sites in these hills have had special religious significance since prehistoric times. The Pentra Ivan burial chamber dates to 3500 BC. The Preseli Hills were the source for the blue stones used to build Stonehenge. Leaving Pembrokeshire, we made our way to Carmarthen, which is Welsh for Merlin, who's thought to have been born here. Outside of town, you can take a path up to an Iron Age hill fort. It's the place where local legend has it that the person who became the mythic Merlin grew up. This hilltop was once a thriving village. Today, it's home to cows and sheep. This land has been farmed for over 2,000 years. We stuck with the minor roads as we entered the beautiful Towy Valley. Overlooking the River Towy are the romantic ruins of Dinver Castle. Edmund Spencer wrote in The Fairy Queen that Merlin communed with spirits in a cave in the hill below the castle. We motored through the valley and into Breckenshire. Our destination, the town of Brecon. It's a delightful spot with a homey feel. There's plenty of quirky shopping, great food, and old inns. We overnighted at the Contra Celef, a 17th century townhouse that's been converted into a bed and breakfast. The facade hides the large garden that's enclosed by the old town wall. Guest rooms are decorated with a comfortable and inviting Georgian period sensibility. The rest of the house has the same warm and friendly atmosphere. Brecon is the stepping off point for a backroads exploration of the heart of Mid Wales through the Brecon Beacon National Park. You'll find unique places like High on Wee, the so called emperor of the book towns. It boasts over 30 used and antiquarian bookshops covering nearly any conceivable subject. From High on Wee, we took a straight shot south through the Black Mountains on our way to Caerleon the site of King Arthur's court, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth. We avoided the main roads and traveled through the 778-foot Gospel Pass. It's the second highest pass in Wales. A great choice for getting an unforgettable on top of the world view. Some believe the circular amphitheater built by the Romans in Caerleon in 75 AD may have inspired Geoffrey of Monmouth to envision a round table for King Arthur. Today, it's easy to imagine a legendary king summoning his knights to save the country and thus preserve his people's pride and identity. Our great drive through Wales underscored what Longfellow once wrote, we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time.